Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic to see such a full house after this uh, long lunch. I hope that you all enjoyed it. It's a good venue for having a chat and discussing things informally. Madame Mogherini, uh, the High Representative for Foreign Affairs, is here now. Uh, and uh, this morning we've had uh, sort of a, bit of a philosophical start perhaps to the day, why Europe matters, Europe in global context. Then we did talk about invigorating the unity of the West and transatlantic relations. And of course now we have a fantastic opportunity, I hope, to cover a whole range of issues from uh, issues that relate to the security policy, defense issues uh, and, and foreign policy of Europe, but also, I'm, I'm sure, uh, about the wider uh, neighborhood and things that concern us greatly uh, that are perhaps geographically distant. Uh, I'm talking about the Pacific issues, the East Asian issues, uh, Korea and so on and so forth. Uh, all the uh, at least this morning we had so many questions, so we tried to uh, keep the question time brief, but I'm not going to tell you how long I'm giving you for the questions at this stage, as we will see how many people will register for, uh, uh, for their uh, questions uh, before. But now, uh, again, as I said, who wants to be a millionaire style? Please, the round of fastest fingers. <laughs> you, you can start registering for the, well, there you go, uh, for the questions immediately, 10, 11, 12, go on, 14. <laughs> um, and I'm very glad to see, uh, of course, that uh, Mr. McAllister uh, from the European Parliament has joined us on the stage. Very welcome, great to have you uh, here. Uh, and um, now I will uh, pass the floor to Madame Mogherini, please. Uh, say your introductory words, what uh, is the latest, what's been going on, what have we been discussing with foreign ministers and everybody else, and then we will open the floor for the questions and, and uh, comments. So welcome, and the floor, Madame Mogherini, is yours. Thank you very much. It works? Yes? It does. Good. Um, well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as, uh, first of all, Great to see plenty of good friends uh, that have been um, members of parliament, European parliament, ministers, and that are in the room, and uh, it's great to see uh, all of you. Uh, it's also great for me, uh, as uh, many of you already might know, uh, for me this opportunity is uh, a good way not only of interacting, getting questions, saying a few things, but also to get the sense of where national parliaments stand on the key EU foreign policy issues and security policy issues we're dealing with. Every time I have bilateral visits to any of our member states, for me it's a great opportunity to get in touch with the national parliaments, to have a sense of priorities, views, and I can tell you it differs very much, and it's all, and this is something you know all very well, but it's also something that helps the, the, the the coming together with a common European Union position uh, beyond the position of governments, because uh, at the end of the day, a common European, a common uh, European foreign security policy uh, is a policy that serves uh, not only the official positions of uh, uh, governments currently in power, but uh, the citizens and national parliaments and European Parliament uh, is uh, the best uh, window to get a sense of what our citizens. Uh, uh, want and feel. And then, as a former member of national parliaments, I, uh, I feel at home. Um, I know you've been discussing many interesting things. Uh, for me, uh, it's excellent to have this opportunity of uh, having an exchange with you back to back with the informal uh, foreign ministers meeting. We just finished uh, now uh, with the foreign ministers. Yesterday, we were with the defense ministers, uh, even having a joint uh, uh, session, foreign and defense ministers. Um, also because for me it's a way, if it's okay for you, rather than giving a speech, uh, to tell you a bit uh, what we discussed or decided with the ministers, uh, and then leaving more space for an exchange of views that um, uh, can be, again, for me, questions, but also comments or suggestions, observations. I'm, I'm ready to take notes uh, and not only to, uh, to answer questions. 
Um, we had an interesting agenda, and I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the presence that David had uh, to many of our sessions, uh, because I think the link between the uh, Council work and the European Parliament work, and in particular, AFET, uh, is uh, extremely valuable. Um, and, uh, and I think that him taking, place, uh, taking part to our um, sessions uh, in the informal level are important. Um, with, the, uh, with the ministers in this couple of days under a wonderful uh, Estonian presidency, wonderful hospitality, apart from the weather that for a Mediterranean like me was a bit of a shock, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> September is, September is uh, a relative concept uh, in Europe. Um, uh, we had a very focused discussion. With the foreign ministers, the main point was DPRK. And I'm sure this uh, has been or will be also a uh, top priority for your work. Uh, we had already had a common position uh, defined in July that we used in the course of the summer to uh, send messages to our partners and uh, friends in Asia, but also in the uh, broader international community, from the United States to China, to Russia, to the Republic of Korea or Japan. Uh, and also to the DPRK, because we have diplomatic channels open with seven of our member states having an embassy in Pyongyang. Um, yesterday, we um, decided, together with the ministers, to uh, support uh, a UN Security Council work to increase the economic pressure on uh, the DPRK, to work on the possibility of introducing uh, autonomous, new autonomous uh, European Union sanctions. And um, what is very important, uh, we decided to jointly work to uh, put pressure on third countries so that they fully implement the UN Security Council resolutions and the existing sanctions. All of this not um, as a name in itself, but to encourage and to put pressure to open that diplomatic channel and dialogue uh, that at the moment is not open uh, at all. Um, with a certain sense of frustration, I have to say, because we have seen in the course of the last months uh, that the president, uh, the new president uh, of the Republic of Korea, has uh, offered uh, to Pyongyang uh, uh, a credible political dialogue, a military to military coordination, uh, some steps that are very practical on uh, um, some family reunification processes. All of this has been not uh, received in Pyongyang. So now the level of uh, frustration is clearly growing. The level of preoccupation is growing. I believe, we all believe, this is uh, a global security threat. This is a serious threat, not only regionally, but also to the global system, the global architecture of nuclear non-proliferation, uh, to which the European Union is extremely attached. Uh, this is why we decided with the ministers to reinforce our support political, diplomatical, but also economical support to the pillars of um, our uh, global common uh, non-proliferation architecture, the IEA, the CTBT organization, and also to uphold the international community to the non-proliferation agreements that were achieved in the past. I think of the Iranian nuclear deal that in this moment is more important than ever, not only for the Iranian file, not only for security in the region, but also for the global environment. Um, we also uh, stressed one point that is very important, I think, for all of us on relation to the PRK. That is that while we put more pressure on the economic side, more pressure on the diplomatic side uh, on Pyongyang, uh, we believe uh, a military escalation would not serve any purpose, if not that of a dangerous risk, not only for the region, but also for the entire world, especially if you have um, a non-rational interlocutor in front of you, it might be extremely dangerous to engage in a military way. Um, this is, I think, a set of coherent, effective, common, uh, united, uh, and determined actions uh, we are going to carry on together uh, at a Euro European Union level with member states that are members of the Security Council in full coordination with the, the uh, P5, uh, with our regional partners, and also in view of um, the UN General Assembly um, 10 days from now. The other point on agenda um, that I'm sure will not surprise many of you, uh, but surprised some, is the Middle East peace process. Uh, it's not high on the headlines currently, but this doesn't mean that uh, the European Union doesn't feel the need 
the responsibility, I would say, um, to keep working on that in the most effective manner. Uh, the trends on the ground are not positive at all. Uh, we uh, felt the need to, first of all, reaffirm the unity, the commitment and the determination of the European Union and the Member States on the two-state solution, exactly in the moment when this is partially put in question. Uh, and we decided also to start a review of the modalities in which the European Union is engaging on the ground, is supporting the process on the ground, to make sure that all the support we're giving, politically, diplomatically, financially, and you know we are by far the first donors, uh, is aimed at the two-state solution and not at preserving the status quo or in the direction of alternatives that are not realistic to happen. Um, this will be part of a constant uh, engagement, common engagement, within the Quartet, with the United States, the Russian Federation and the United Nations, and with our, our partners, namely with uh, uh, Jordan, Egypt, the Arab League, uh, some of the Gulf countries that were at the center of the Arab Peace Initiative. I think it is important in this moment, again, even if it's not in the headlines, uh, to reaffirm the European Union uh, interest and priority on this because it could turn easily uh, again into um, uh, a clear um, escalation or uh, it can become easily uh, a clear security threat for the region and uh, and for Europe. Um, the, uh, this morning we had uh, a point on Venezuela that uh, I'm sure could be of interest of uh, many of you, uh, mainly to compare notes um, explore options uh, and uh, uh, continue to work with our partners, especially in Latin America, in the Caribbean, and again in view of the UN General Assembly, to try and uh, establish some kind of format that can help uh, the country to come out of a very serious uh, crisis. Um, some ministers had uh, in different uh, recent contacts, myself as well. So uh, again, on this point, we didn't have uh, any new policy, um, let's say, decisions or developments, but we just checked where we are and uh, decided to continue working, in particular closely linking our work with uh, our partners in the region. Um, I was also asked to provide options for uh, member states to consider if they want to in the coming days or weeks, um, the hypothesis of uh, uh, introducing targeted sanctions on individuals. I provided these options, the discussion will start, but it's very early stage. The focus was mainly and remains mainly on diplomatic uh, uh, tools. Uh, we also had today the usual uh, exchange with the candidate countries, uh, attracted quite some media interest, as you can imagine, uh, but it was as often the case, um, more um, the media tension than the tension inside the room. Um, we always have, when we have informal meetings with the foreign ministers, um, a session with the foreign ministers of the candidate countries where we do not discuss the accession negotiations. We don't discuss the status of candidate countries. We discuss common issues of interest. And I think this is the right approach because Having common points on the agenda, we discuss together, it can be migration, it can be some foreign policy issues, it can be, as it was today, preventing radicalization and tackling uh, extremism. It shows that we have things to do together and it prepares the ground for future membership. Then it can go all the way and we could have some of them coming in as new members. It can not. But the fact of working together on specific policies, I think, prepares the ground among the ministers, but also in the wider public opinion uh, for common approaches and policies. So today we discussed with them uh, how to better tackle and prevent radicalization, how to manage the phenomenon of the return of foreign fighters, something particular relevant to discuss with countries like Turkey or our friends in the Western Balkans, uh, because as we um, have worse conditions on the ground in Iraq and Syria for Daesh, we see more and more the need to face um, effective policies to um, handle this phenomenon in, uh, inside Europe. Um, 
I think this wraps up more or less what we had on the level of foreign uh, ministers. I would like to add one point, two points uh, that we tackled with defense ministers, if that's fine for you, because I know you are in a mixed uh, uh, composition, format. Uh, one is uh, the work uh, we are doing, well, three actually. One is the specific Estonian input. Uh, that was extremely appreciated by the ministers. Uh, and that was an exercise on uh, cyber attack. Um, I have to tell you, I think, uh, this is one of the fields where we need to develop as European Union, but also as national authorities, national parliaments, governments, a lot more of a capacity to prevent, to react, to exercise, to have a deterrence. I think this is a field of security that is really crucial for our work uh, and where for sure Estonia has potentially a very important leading role. Uh, the other two points we uh, discussed with a very good outcome with the defense ministers was on one side the work we're doing with the Sahel and with the Horn of Africa. Um, it's not about uh, um, calibrating the south and the east, uh, the geography of it. It's a matter of strategic interest for the European Union uh, to contribute to the security and the development uh, of our partners in the Sahel and in the Horn of Africa for the entire European Union. Because of the um, measures we have to take together with them uh, to prevent terrorist organizations from gaining ground uh, and resources uh, to fight traffickers of all kinds, arms, drugs, human beings, and to try and stabilize countries and places where conflict was there till very recently. Uh, and as you know, as the European Union, we have been, as you m might know, it's not, uh, um, uh, it's not compulsory. Uh, in the Sahel, we are um, there on the development angle, providing uh, a lot of uh, resources to develop economic and social opportunities for local communities. We are there with European Union uh, missions and operations, civilian and military, to support the security forces there, including training on human rights standards and management of difficult situations. And we are also the ones that have uh, contributed. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we signed a contract uh, with 50 million euros to the joint force that the Sahel G5 countries decided to establish to control the territory. You can imagine huge territory, desert, uh, cross-border um, threats, uh, a very challenging environment even for countries that have much more developed security uh, system. We are there to help um, and uh, we're going to continue to develop this uh, partnership with our friends in the Sahel uh, even more. With Libya in the situation uh, as it is, it's quite clear the Sahel is the direct neighborhood of the European Union. So we, it's a strategic investment for our security as well. Uh, in the Horn of Africa, we have a very successful uh, result on uh, um, countering piracy of the Horn of Africa with Operation Atalanta. Now it's a matter of uh, understanding how we can better support Somalia uh, in a challenging time uh, with a review possibly of our presence there. We have different operations and uh, uh, missions there and uh, uh, quite a large envelope of uh, um, development cooperation there. Um, last but not least at all, and here I come to the, uh, to the end of it, uh, we defined yesterday with the defense and the foreign ministers together um, the uh, common commitments to launch the permanent structure cooperation. I believe that this can be done uh, by the end of September, the definition of the common commitments. This would allow the member states that are interested in doing that to send us a notification of their willingness to jointly enter uh, a permanent structure cooperation. This could be done, I believe, already in October, and that would allow us to launch the permanent structure cooperation by the end of the Estonian presidency. It's not a debate about how much Europeans spend on defense. I have said several times, I think last time in the European Parliament, it's not about a militarization of the European Union. This is a choice that lies in two national parliaments. How much every single member state invests in defense and how, it's a choice for national parliaments. What the European Union can do is to offer common ways to invest jointly 
whatever national parliaments decide to invest on the defence. And this, I believe, we all believe, uh, would provide, first of all, an industrial basis that at the moment is fragmented in Europe and uh, provokes a lot of, uh, how do you say, dispersion of resources? Thanks. Um, I think I quoted several times. We invest 50% of the Americans in defense. The outcome is 15%. There is a lot of money that gets out of the results-oriented approach. Here, the European Union can help uh, making the most out of every single euro spent. It can have an impact on the industrial uh, European environment, especially the small and medium enterprises, I believe, technology and uh, innovation. But uh, it is also, I think, a fundamental el uh, element for the European strategic autonomy, which in these times of global policy that is shifting and changing and is more and more unpredictable, constitutes in itself um, an element of reassurance for Europeans, I believe. The more we are able to um, rely on our own means, including industrial means in the field of defence, uh, to use them the European way, uh, and as you know very well, the European Union doesn't have missions or operations around the world to bomb anyone, but to assist partners to be trained, to do security in a certain way that is more preventive and integrated with other measures than um, let's say, on a, on a traditionally uh, military intervention approach, uh, the more we are free to define our own political agenda also in the security field. This will be supported by the European Defence Fund that the Commission has put forward, and also on that, I believe that we will be able to launch uh, the fund uh, by either the end of the Estonian presidency or the beginning of the Bulgarian one, to which I am looking forward, and I am sure that we will have an excellent I think seventh or eighth opportunity to meet in this format in Sofia uh, in the first half of next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Federica. <laughs> and now, dear friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have one hour, 22 minutes, roughly, for uh, lively debate and discussion. We have uh, currently 26 colleagues who wow. would like to take floor for questions or comments, and I would like to ask you to be uh, very precise, and uh, perhaps, if you agree with me, let's do one minute each. Uh, and uh, we will group uh, five of you uh, for questions, and then Federica will answer on, on, on your questions. First uh, question comes from European Parliament. Anna Komas, please. Thank you. This is working. Is it working? Uh, no need to press anything. Do not press anything. It will no? turn automatically. Okay. No, you not press. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, thank you, uh, Federica, and uh, well, congratulations if indeed you managed to discuss all that and uh, along those lines that you pointed out to us. And in particular, in the case of uh, DPRK, okay, of course, we're not dealing only with one irrational interlocutor. Actually, uh, there are at least two, <laughs> considering Trump. Uh, my question is about the Sahel. Uh, I'm very concerned that our policy cannot be in any way of uh, uh, being seen as paying detention camps and torture. That is what is going on in Libya and possibly elsewhere, namely in the Horn of Africa with EU funding. This will come back to haunt us. This will feed the narrative of terrorist groups, not to mention, of course, traffickers and so on. Uh, is this a very crucial question? And there is, is also a link to make the, 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 the holistic approach with the working. taxation and not allowing our financial system to continue to be the conduit for terrorist financing? Thank you, Anna. Uh, next question, please. Oyer Serex Kalnic from Latvia. Well, welcome back to the Baltics. Uh, last year brought two great shocks to the European system, uh, the Brexit and the U.S. presidential election. But my question is on Brexit. Uh, most of the negotiations concern finances, social issues, um, trade. But what's the future of the U.K.-EU foreign policy uh, cooperation? Uh, each of our countries wants to deepen our bilateral ties with the U.K. in foreign affairs, but do you envision 
envision a mechanism for EU-UK uh, cooperation. Uh, for example, on things like sanctions, where joint cooperation can be very important. Thank you. Thank you, Eris. And uh, our next speaker will be from uh, Spain, Mr. Pablo Bustinde. Thank you. Madam High Representative, we have been discussing for months about the project to produce a vast increase in military expenditure. Your position, you qualify that position saying that it uh, doesn't need to be quantitative, that it can be qualitative. But not surprisingly, we are witnessing at the same time a booming arts trade, uh, arms trade market, including with countries that are responsible for blatant violations of human rights, which goes against international law and EU law. So we keep flooding regions in conflict with arms and often don't know even what is the final destination of those arms, which is a massive threat to our security. So this spiral of an arms race, growing geopolitical tensions, and a dialectic of confrontation reminds of some of the darkest moments of our history, precisely those that the European Union project was supposed, supposedly born to conjure. So one simple question to you. Um, do you know of any historical example where a massive increase of military spending has led to stable periods of peace, prosperity, and democratic development instead of simply war? Thanks a lot. Thank you. And uh, next one from European Parliament, uh, Urmas Pait, please, Urmas. Thank you very much, dear Federica. First on Estonian weather. Well, I guess these days Estonia is offering us average EU weather. Um, but I have also two bit more serious issues. First, defense union. I'm glad that also among defense ministers you discuss this. And for me, one of the main issues during now Estonian presidency is to move forward with concrete steps uh, with defense union. Do you see it is realistic at this stage, if you look at the timetable, that still before the end of the year, there will be possible to have another concrete steps to realize this idea of defense union? And my second issue is uh, how well EU is able to protect its citizens. As we all know, 14 Estonian and UK uh, ship guards are almost four years already in India in prison. And nothing helps, they are still there. Court cases even uh, not completely finished yet, but our people are still there and they are suffering. So that uh, which you see could be the possibilities for EU foreign action service as well to increase in this sense, the influence to Indian authorities to solve this issue positively as soon as possible. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, the fifth uh, in this group will be from Iceland, Mrs. Jona Solveig Elina Totter. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we need to mention gender equality. We need to mention it because when it comes to security and defense, we continue to lag far behind. For instance, of 22 speakers named in our conference's agenda, there are only two women. This actually reflects a larger general problem of women not being equally represented in decision-making on security and defense. The, EU, the EU's global strategy emphasizes the importance of mainstreaming gender across policy sectors and institutions. This includes promoting the role of women in peace efforts, implementing Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, and improving the EU's internal gender balance. My question to Ms. Mogherini is, how do you envision improving the EU's internal gender balance? Are you focusing on the field of security and defense spe specifically? Because we need to include women at all levels, not only in the cleaning up the mess phase that is in conflict resolution and peace processes. Thank you. Please, Mom. Am I wrong? You asked the same question last year. Is it possible? <laughs> uh, I remember you, uh, and I remember the question because uh, uh, um, I'm afraid last year was I was even the only one woman in the program, so we're improving. No, apart from that, um, you're preaching to the converted. Uh, how many times it happens to me to be the only woman in the room, or how many times it happens to me, which is a good thing, but 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 it's weird uh, to come into a room for a bilateral meeting, and on my side I have all women, and on the other side with all men. And it's like if my interlocutors expected me to explain why on my side I have all women. 
it's out of coincidence. Sometimes I have old men. Uh, I would say that in my delegation today were more or less uh, three women and two men, so with me four, so more or less we're keeping the balance. This to say uh, that in the European Union, in terms of uh, European institutions, uh, the EES, the Commission, uh, what uh, we can uh, have a direct influence on uh, more directly. Um, the numbers are going up of women in top positions because I also don't want to see a lot of women, but all not in management positions. And this is not too difficult because normally we have good women uh, climbing up the stairs quite, uh, uh, quite well. But when it comes to, for instance, the number of women ministers sitting around the council table, this is a member state's uh, decision. I cannot choose ministers uh, instead of the governments or the national parliaments uh, that I give the confidence vote to um, governments that sometimes have very little women in it. Or some other times you have half and half. And sometimes you have women in positions in government that are not the traditionally women places. We have an enormous amount of women defense ministers in this moment, including in your country. Uh, we have very little foreign ministers women. Uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, three uh, in total. Um, but it's also true that foreign ministers tend to turn uh, quite quickly, so uh, <laughs> we will see. Uh, but for the moment, I'm happy with what I have. But this to say that uh, this is something that needs to be addressed at all levels. National parliaments, government, national governments, uh, and sometimes the rest is a reflection of these choices. And when it comes to women, peace and security, we are working very hard to implement at all levels uh, of our action um, this policy. Uh, but apart from that, um, I like to see um, we have women and obviously also very qualified men uh, in all strands of action we have from trade to security, to defense, to whatever. Uh, development, it's not only the typical narrative that women are better to um, face the post-conflict resolution of the mediation. No, we also need women in our military missions and operations, and, that, and they're very good in that. That's a strong European Union point, and this is also the practice, and it's not only the policy. Um, Urmas, I think it is very realistic to think that we can launch the permanent structure cooperation by the end of the Estonian presidency, which means having a formal council uh, conclusion, a formal council decision uh, by the end of the year, and uh, a European uh, uh, council sort of blessing uh, this uh, process with concrete projects. We have so far, and we have not even received the notification from member states that they want to have a permanent structure cooperation. We have already now received some 30 projects um, sort of candidating for being projects for the structure, uh, permanent structure cooperation. So I think it is realistic. And if I can share with you a personal note, um, and as we know each other since quite some time, I can, and in the, in the close of this um, uh, privacy room, uh, being streamed low exactly well. one year ago, at the previous, previous uh, Gimnik, at the previous, previous informal ministerial, um, we, I put on the table for the first time the need to work on the um, defense union. And I remember very well back then, it was in Bratislava, September last year, the skepticism was 200%. Everybody was telling me, you'll never get there, forget it. It has been decades, this issue has been floating around. Everybody's failed, it's never going to work. It's not because we've had uh, the UK referendum that is going to happen, and in fact, it is not because of the UK referendum that it is happening. It's because security issues are higher on the agenda, and it's because I think we're coming out of a serious financial crisis in Europe and I believe national governments and national parliaments, which is you, understand very well that every single euro invested in defense has to be spent in the wisest possible manner, and the European Union provides a service in this respect of joining investments together. I think this is the reason why this is realistic. But I last year, if you asked me the same question, I would have answered, yes, it is realistic, and everybody would have laughed. I think now we're there. Not you, I know. <laughs> now we are there, and I think we, we will make it for, for December. 
uh, how the European Union helps protect European Union citizens outside of the European Union. As you know well, because you have been a foreign minister, uh, the consular part of uh, our European work uh, is formally in the hands of member states. The role of the European Union is to assist, accompany, provide messages, strengthen messages, provide locally, and this is something we are doing very much, including in India, and I know the file very well for other reasons you know very well as well, um, supporting the work of the member states, locally and uh, globally. Uh, I've also always said, I'm not uh, shy, if member states decide at a certain moment that they want to give more consular powers or competences to the European Union level, I'm happy to take the challenge and, uh, and see how we can together protect our citizens more outside of the borders. But as far as now, um, our role is to support a company and being actively engaged in passing the message that a European Union citizen that is in trouble for different kind of reasons outside of the European borders is not only its own national member state that is taking care of that, but it's also all the European Union that is behind that. Um, Pablo, um, it is indeed not how much we spend, but uh, uh, how we spend. The how much is your decision as national members of parliament? Because the national budgets on defense are defined in national parliaments. Uh, the European institutions, like the European parliament, have, have no say in how much member states def decide to put in the defense budgets. This is a 2% debate for national parliaments and governments that are NATO allies. It's not a European Union debate. What is a European Union service to member states, being them governments, parliaments, citizens, is to say, look, if you spend that kind of amount of money, that can be one, 10 or 100 uh, alone, this is the result you get. If that same amount of money you invest together with others, this is the result you get, which is more strategic, more effective economically, and I would say more European, uh, in the sense that we strengthen a certain vision, a certain way of doing security and foreign policy, which is investing in the non-military side. Sometimes you need the technology, the, uh, the capacities also to push forward an agenda that is a preventive agenda or that is helping parties to a conflict to come out of the conflict. Sometimes, and the UN knows that very well, you need monitors in a difficult place that you don't send like that. We have security challenges around the world and I'm proud to say we have a European specific way to tackle security issues that is always looking at the non-military component of, of conflicts, crises, and tensions. On arms trade, the European Union has the strictest regime in the world. It is up to member states to monitor, and I know the European Parliament has put a point on, uh, uh, on the agenda for next Tuesday on this, so I'll come back to that uh, next, uh, next week. Um, but the European Union has the strictest possible uh, regime on arms trade control, and on arms control, by the way, in general terms, because we are the strongest advocates in the world for, for instance, the arms trade treaty and uh, the entire non-proliferation regime. And this is a point of credibility for us because we know very well that this is part of the prevention of conflicts and crises. Um, oh, yes. Hi. <laughs> Great to be back in the Baltics. Um, the future of UK-EU cooperation in foreign policy, by definition, cannot be defined now. It's not a way of not answering to your question, but it's the decision that member states have taken uh, in how we will handle the negotiations on Brexit. Then, if you ask me, and if you ask all of the 28, including the UK, you will hear the same story. We wish it will be the most constructive and partnership-oriented one that we can build. And I'm sure it will be the case. But we have decided together that we will define the future partnership after we have settled the, uh, the way out agreements. And I think it makes sense. On the sanctions regime, 
which is something that is very close to the UK's heart, and not only the heart, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's like for all the other, it's going to be like for all the other sectors of the European Union decision-making processes, on the sanctions, on the missions and operations, on the policies that we put in place. You're a member state, you contribute to the decision-making, you're not a member state, you can always join, but you cannot propose and you cannot determine the choice. So I imagine that in the future we can always have a partnership like we have with many other partners in the world that would welcome the UK joining EU positions or um, decisions. But for sure you lose the seat at the table that provides you the opportunity to suggest, to propose, to uh, arguments and also to decide. Uh, last but not least at all, Sahel. And it's not only Sahel, it's also Libya. And I thank you for the question, because I think it's very good to clarify this very, very, very clearly. The European Union is not waking up today to the situation of the detention centers. We knew, and I remember we've talked about that tens of times in this format, in the European Parliament, everywhere. And you know where I come from. And the first stories I heard of women that were arriving in Lampedusa, having experienced the slavery of the desert and of the centers, these are stories you don't forget. And this is exactly why we have started with a lot of fights, but finally we have started to do the right thing, which is financing the projects of the IOM and the UNHCR, and also the international NGOs to access the camps, to rescue the migrants, to provide, in some cases, the basic, basic services, water, sanitation, food, but also information about what's coming next and also alternatives. I know that some in Europe emphasize the voluntary returns, the assisted voluntary returns as a big victory because it's people going back home. To me, it's also people we take away from the smugglers' slavery. It's also people we rescue from going in chains on a boat that could sink. We've had this year, uh, what is it, 6,000, more or less 6,000 migrants from January onwards that out of our financements to the IOM and the UNHCR, in Libya even, and in the Sahel, have been assisted, no, ten, around 10,000 assisted, saved in certain cases, and some of them voluntarily assisted to return to their homes, and also starting projects in their home communities to restart a life. Small businesses, training, especially for women, that go back and have lost everything sometimes even their babies or their families. So we don't, not only we don't close our eyes in front of the inhuman conditions uh, they're living in, but it's exactly because we knew that this was the condition even before uh, the big stories were coming out, that we have started to work with the IOM, the UNHCR and the international NGOs to give assistance to the migrants all over the way in the desert, in Libya, and obviously at sea, saving them. Is it enough? No. For me, every single person that dies, every single person that is in a camp, every single person that has no assistance on the way, I would say, if you allow me, every single person that lives in the hands of the smugglers, in a form of slavery, it's not enough, the, what, what we're doing, because we should not have that kind of conditions, which means and I know you personally agree, but in this room I don't know how many would agree, which means that we have to offer legal alternatives to come to Europe to destroy the smugglers' business. You have to be aware of that. <laughs> that is also our commitment. We have taken the commitment that we partner with the African countries to work with them on the dismantling of the criminal networks. That is something we are doing, increasing the human rights standards all along the route, but in, a, in alternative, we have to open up legal, controlled, safe channels of migrants that, by the way, I know this is also an issue for heated national debates, are in some cases, if coming through regular legal channels, 
vital to our economies, because if tomorrow morning Europe would wake up with no migrants on its territory, entire sectors of our economy would collapse. It's a reality of facts. The point is, we have to substitute the traffickers' networks, criminal organizations making money out of people's desperation with regular, controlled, rational, sustainable human channels. It's going to be a long way, but this is the way finally we got to. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for the first uh, slot of answers and first uh, slot of questions. We will proceed uh, immediately. And the next question will be by Carlos Costa Neves from Portugal. Please, the floor is yours. Thank and, you, Chair. Uh, please, let's uh, fit the questions into one minute. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, High Rep Representative, for your very much interesting introductory remarks especially the update of the common commitments coming from the ministers of defense meeting. Uh, it's very good to have a precise roadmap and a precise timetable. It's a very important progress. And we are at the same time sticking to the conclusions of the European Council of June, that what is very important. Uh, congratulations also by the, those conclusions. Uh, two questions. Um, first of all, about uh, NATO border sharing, EU NATO. Don't you think that it would be useful to have some kind of joint position between member states uh, in the way? to face the, the goal of 2% or do, would you prefer to have each one by itself? Second question, uh, could you make uh, some kind of update of the situation in West, Western Balkans? Thank you. Uh, thank you. And the next one up, Eugene Front from the European Parliament, please. Yes, uh, Federica, I'm here to your right. right. Uh, I have one uh, very simple question with regard to North Korea. Uh, which kind of communication takes place at present with the U.S. administration and the European Union? And do you have the impression that uh, our voice, your voice, uh, is being heard there? Thank you. Uh, thank you. In Washington. Uh, it will be, of course, interesting to hear what sort of communications we have with Pyongyang. Uh, we have a number, of, a number of embassies there present, as we know. Estonia, by the way, only one of two countries in Europe which doesn't have a diplomatic relations with North Korea, but that's a uh, side remark. Uh, please, from Slovenia, Mr. Joseph Horvat. Your Excellency, first let me thank you uh, for, for uh, your recent constructive visit at the National Assembly of the Republic of Slovenia. We particularly appreciate your support to Slovenia's strong belief that the rule of law is one of the fundamental cohesive forces of the EU. We are convinced that the respecting the rule of law includes both respecting the international treaties and agreements, as well as final awards of internationally recognized in institutions. Therefore, they shouldn't be treated differently. It is essential that all the members of the EU are committed to that idea regardless of the national interests. Thus, I call to all the member states to fully respect the rule of law. In particular, we invite our neighboring friendly country, Republic of Croatia, to respect the final award of the Tribunal Court of Arbitration. I'm strongly convinced that the rule of law is the value on which the EU prospers or fails. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Since we've been always talking about PESCO these days, I need to be careful with the next name. Mr. Paolo Pisco from Portugal, please. Um, dear Agri, uh, Agri uh, Representative, I'm very glad to see your determination in trying to solve the problems that the world is facing. My questions are about uh, Venezuela. Venezuela is living a huge crisis, economically, social, and politically. 
and uh, not only for at le uh, regional level, for the regional organizations, uh, but also because of the huge communities of citizens with origin in Europe, like uh, Portuguese, like Spanish or Italian. Um, recently, uh, European Union did not recognize the new uh, um, uh, assembly, constituent assembly, and you said that you were prepared for uh, have a greater pressure on Venezuela. So my questions are, how do you see the present situation and which are the diligences that have been made to come to an acceptable solution? And on the other hand, if the European Union has in mind the protection of the European citizens and interests in Venezuela, and also if you agree with uh, Freddy Guevara, the Vice President of the Parliament, that say that uh, you European Union should join United States and Latin America to isolate, um, to isolate Venezuela. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Last but not least for this uh, block, Mr. Aristos Domino from Cyprus, please. There, Ms. Mogherini, my question uh, is regard, it, it's, uh, with regard to the interrelation between migration and foreign policy. We all agree that the situation in the southern Mediterranean and in the Middle East continues to be alarming. The need to address the situation is high, in this highly volatile uh, region continues to be of utmost importance, and the EU should play a more active role in conflict resolution, safeguarding impartiality in all conflicts. Um, my concern is whether we are focusing more on issues of justice and home affairs rather than issues of foreign policy, which to a large extent relate to the uh, causes of migration towards Europe. So what is your position in this, bearing in mind that we should focus more on <laughs> principles and values rather than tactics and geopolitical um, issues? Thank you. Uh, please, we'll end this block with that. And Madame Mogherini, please. And I'll, I'll try. To, you should put the time limit to me as well, because it's not fair. <laughs> they have one minute, and I can speak as much, uh, as, much as I want. I'll try to be uh, shorter. Um, on the European Union defense, I think I already said, Carlos, uh, I think uh, the uh, decision on how much of the national budgets is dedicated to defense is uh, a decision uh, of national parliaments. Uh, and national governments, uh, but as far as I know, it's a choice of national parliaments in all European countries. Uh, but again, what the European Union can and is doing is uh, to offer um, the best possible way of investing together. So no much, not so much how member states spend, but how they can spend better together. On the Western Balkans, I'm happy to share um, an update uh, uh, also mm -hmm. because I, um, I put as uh, um, a personal um, uh, objective that of repeating at least every two or three days, and not uh, less than that, um, the determination I personally have and that I share with uh, my colleagues in the European Union institutions, that by the end of the mandate of this commission, which is two years and a half from now, even less, that all the countries in the Western Balkans, all the partners we have in the Western Balkans have done so relevant steps towards the European Union that the process becomes irreversible. I know this is a debate that is uh, toxic in national parliaments inside the European Union, in some of them. I know that also the closest you get to the region, the less toxic the debate becomes. Yeah which may be a sign uh, of wisdom and, and understanding of how much in terms of security and economic interests uh, we have uh, to gain uh, if we manage to have a credible um, uh, process of the Western Balkans inside the European Union. I don't use normally the word enlargement. I'm quite allergic to that because uh, the enlargement idea is that you have a center that is Brussels, basically, that gets larger and larger and includes others at the periphery. I believe that if you look at the geography of the Western Balkans, the Western Balkan six are already inside some European Union borders. <laughs> it's an island within the European Union. That is not European Union, but uh, to me it's a sort of uh, um, fill in the gap, uh, completing the process. Um, what I see is um, that the year we have closed with this summer has been extremely tense. 
with very serious political crisis in the region, uh, some very serious uh, uh, tensions uh, within and uh, uh, among and between uh, actors in the Western Balkans, repeated electoral campaigns, which are feeded in most cases rhetoric that has not helped. But at the end of the day, what I've seen is that each and every of the Western Balkan six have at the end of the day reaffirmed their commitment to the European Union uh, future. For two simple reasons, I believe. One is that uh, the citizens of the region clearly want that. If you look at the numbers of public trust in the European Union in the Western Balkans, in the member states we forget it. <laughs> and second, it's because of the economy. On the population, I would like to add one thing. It's a young population that has lived conflict, because only 20 years ago that region was in war, and that is eager to look at the future, turn the page. And they know very well, they associate the European Union with the future. So I think we have a sort of responsibility, a moral responsibility. And I think the leaders of the region, at the end of the day, know they have a responsibility towards the younger generation and towards that people. But the second, more prosaic reason is the economy, the businesses, the infrastructures, the investments, and only a serious reform process when it comes to uh, the judiciary, the rule of law, the way in which the administration works, and so on and so forth, the reconciliation can provide a secure, stable environment for investments and economic development and creation of opportunities for the young people. And only the process towards the European Union provides an excellent environment for regional cooperation, which is the key to economic development and social development. So I am a, a Western Balkan optimist, even if I know very well many people look at me as if I was completely crazy uh, or naive, I still think that the energy that is there in the region is the best possible engine for making the entire region move, provided that we, and we is you, because national parliaments have a say in that, are on our side credible on this process. And I really hope that we will be in the conditions of uh, fulfilling our responsibilities on that file. Eugen, um, what kind of communication we have with DC? Open, very frank, uh, constant. Uh, I met with Tillerson a couple of weeks ago, um, and we're going to meet again in New York. Constant, at all levels. Um, at all levels and with all. My level with uh, the Secretary of State, or my level with Vice President Pence, we have an excellent channel of communication, constantly open. Uh, as you know, we received the visit of President Trump in Brussels, we met together with uh, our two president, our three presidents. Uh, open. We don't always agree on things. On DPRK, I think we share um, the basic elements of our analysis, which is the um, increased danger, um, the threat that has reached a level uh, of unprecedented uh, magnitude uh, for all of us. Uh, we have been probably more uh, determined from the beginning uh, than our American friends to say that uh, the solution has to come through diplomatic and political dialogue. Obviously, it's difficult to argue something like that in the moment when in Pyongyang there doesn't seem to be any intention to engage in a credible dialogue. Uh, but <coughs> for sure, this has been um, a difference in, uh, in the message we have sent. Uh, to be very clear, we have been more on the same kind of narrative that our friends in Seoul have been um, advocating uh, for. Uh, but I think that um, for sure the European Union uh, voice is heard, uh, for sure it's recognized, for sure our arguments are considered. Um, as well as we hear their voice, we consider their arguments, we value them, and uh, sometimes we find common ground. In most cases we find common ground, for instance, on the DPRK, we would support, uh, as the European Union and with our member states that are in the Security Council currently, uh, new UN Security Council resolution introducing tougher sanctions. On this, uh, for instance, I think we are uh, looking at the same uh, kind of uh, economic pressure. Um, 
by the way, what kind of relations we have with DPRK, uh, we do have channels open. We have a critical engagement together with economic sanctions. Uh, we have seven member states having an embassy in Pyongyang. We have also at European Union level, um, historically, uh, some sort of political dialogue. In the last years, it has proven to be much more difficult uh, and, uh, um, and complicated. But we keep the door for dialogue open. And um, I, I didn't meet bilaterally, um, but I crossed the foreign minister of DPRK just a month ago in uh, Manila, where we were together at the ASEAN uh, Regional Forum, together with Tillerson, uh, Lavrov, uh, the Chinese foreign minister, and uh, the Korean foreign minister, the South Korean foreign minister, the Japanese foreign minister. So we are part of the international community at, uh, at the top level, and obviously uh, whatever top issue comes on the table, we, we try to put our uh, contribution to that. That in this case, it is particularly appreciated for two reasons. One is that we have good contacts and good relations to all uh, in the region, um, and we don't have our own particular agenda. Uh, we don't have our own direct interests on, on this file. Uh, and also because when it comes to nuclear negotiations, we have developed over 12 years a certain technical experience, uh, both related to nuclear issues, related to nuclear-related sanctions. So there is a competence there that can be used. Um, Joseph, thank you very much for having hosted me. Where are you? I lost. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for having hosted me a few days ago in, uh, in Ljubljana. It was an excellent exchange. Um, I had no doubt you would have raised the issue of arbitration also here. Uh, as I said, in Ljubljana, but also, as I said, in, in Zagreb when I was there um, in July, uh, the European Union attaches great importance to the respect of uh, uh, the rulings uh, uh, and international arbitrations, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Croatia and Slovenia, as two member states uh, of the European Union, will find a way to implement uh, the ruling, um, and we expect that to happen. Uh, Paolo, Venezuela, uh, as I said, we recognize the, um, not only the seriousness of the crisis on different levels, political, economic, um, I, lost, I lost you, yes, uh, political, economic, social, uh, we also recognize uh, the uh, importance uh, for the European Union uh, in this respect uh, for two reasons. One is that we attach great importance to um, Latin America, the relations we have with Latin America, and in particular with uh, some players in Latin America that are currently making enormous historical steps. I think of Colombia, uh, where the Pope was visiting just uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, where we are supporting as the European Union with the trust fund, the implementation of the uh, peace agreement, uh, and where clearly, if the situation deteriorates in Venezuela, uh, things would be much more difficult, or the stability of the Caribbean that are today, in these days, hit by a terrible hurricane, uh, and that are dependent on many different links in economic or energy terms uh, with their neighbors. So we do care about the stability and the future of the region. It's, uh, it's a brotherly or sisterly region to us. Um, an Italian saying this to Portuguese, uh, is, 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 it's even too much. <laughs> uh, but um, that's the first reason, obvious reason. Uh, the second one is because, as you said, we have an enormous amount of double citizens. We have EU citizens that are citizens of Venezuela. We have a lot of Europeans that live in Venezuela without being Venezuelan citizens. We have a lot of uh, mixed families. We have a lot of uh, mixed businesses, small enterprises, or big investments. We are exposed in all ways uh, to what uh, is happening in Venezuela. Uh, so we do care. And this is the first effort I'm trying to do to pass the message that it is not external or Western or post post-colonial interference. This is because we are the same family, because we are friends, that we do care about what's happening there. Uh, and we want to try to help. I believe, we believe that the only way is the full respect of institutions. And this is why we have um, not recognized the latest steps, because there is a parliament in place. Uh, and beyond the full recognition of the institutions and their autonomy, their capacity to work together, which also requires an effort from all sides. 
uh, for the benefit of the Venezuelans. Uh, I believe the uh, uh, the best possible way uh, is and would be the creation of a framework in the region that can accompany Venezuela and all the Venezuelan uh, actors uh, on the path of dialogue and shared responsibility. Because the situation is so serious from all points of view that it requires really different forces to come together. And we would be more than happy to support a process of um, different regional forces coming together and trying to accompany this, this internal dialogue. I'm, I hope it's not too late, because the situation is so much deteriorated um, that um, last year I was probably m going to be more, more positive about that perspective with the engagement of the three presidents and all of that. Now we are in a different stage. I really hope that the, the Venezuelan forces, together with the, um, the regional actors um, and with all our support, if they wish so, uh, can engage in a serious uh, process to come out of that, uh, of that crisis. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm very long on migration. I'll be very short because I've said already a few things. Um, I was shocked. Uh, maybe some of you heard m me saying this already. When I arrived in Brussels, um, I was an Italian minister holding the Italian presidency. And uh, for us, it was only natural uh, to see the issue of migration as uh, um, a combination of internal and external policies because it's clear migrants come from outside. It's, uh, it's by definition, uh, an issue that has to be tackled from the roots, from the countries of origin to the countries of transit, to um, the um, policies you put in place inside the Union um, to make it, uh, um, as I said before, humane and sustainable uh, and secure, especially for the migrants. I've always found it strange arriving in Brussels to see that the migration didn't appear on the Foreign Affairs Council agendas, was not related to foreign policy, as if it was just a border or, or a justice or a home affair minister, uh, minister's uh, issue, uh, as if the phenomenon appeared only once they were in. Um, it's not a security uh, issue. It's a, it's a complex phenomenon that comes from far away and involves tens of millions of people in the world. Uh, so you need a global strategy, actually, much beyond the EU-Africa or the EU-Asia relationship. And this is why I'm happy now we are in a different place than two or three years ago. Now we have a partnership with the African countries. We're going to have an EU-African Union Summit in November that is going to highlight this friendship and partnership in all different sectors and fields. Now we are contributing in a significant, I would say, determined way to the global compacts that the UN system is putting in place on refugees and migrants to have a comprehensive approach to the migration phenomenon. So uh, I think that in these two, three years, the European Union has moved enormously in its understanding of the phenomenon and also in the policies that it's putting in place. A lot, a lot, a lot of way to go still, not satisfied <laughs> yet, but I think we are finally on the good track. Thank you, Federica. And now we move uh, ahead with the uh, next group of five. And first one is uh, Mr. Mati Vanhanen from Finland. Please. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I will continue with Africa strategy. Uh, how do you coordinate uh, EU, EU institutions' Africa work, work and monthly or annual? And do you have, have some hopes to member states? And the same question also to David, David McAllister. Your opinion about the coherency of EU institutions and member states, Africa strategies and implementation of those as a whole? Thank you, Matti. Next one uh, is our colleague from Portugal, Mr. Sergio Azevedo. Please. Madam High Representative, um, the NATO Civilian Intelligence Committee, presided over this year by Portugal, probably will recognize the southern uh, multifaceted threat as a new element of risk. And by this, it's obvious that we can predict that terrorism will be at the center of these new risks, but also the recognition that share of intelligence between states, despite doing better, still needs to run a long way to reach the desired level of achievement to turn uh, prevention more effective. 
objective. Paraphrasing the Italian minister Alfano, that quite well resumes most of the public opinion on this matter, terrorism is fast and Europe is slow. Since a global threat can only be thought on a global scale, what EU is willing to do in order to reach a more global response to this threat? Thank you. Next one from Hungary, Mr. Zsolt Nemet, please. Zsolt. Thank you, Marco. Uh, dear Federica, uh, welcome. Hungary is chairing the Visegrad Four this year, and uh, our priority is the Eastern Partnership. And uh, especially, I would like to ask you about the Ukraine. And uh, in the Ukraine, I would like to draw your attention that this week, there was a law adopted, the so-called education law, uh, which creates a very strange situation. Uh, secondary school and university uh, level education is prohibited except the state language. And we believe that uh, this is partially understandable. On the other hand, this curtails the elementary rights of national minorities, especially in the western and southern part, Romanian, uh, Polish, Bulgarian, Hungarian minorities are very negatively influenced by this. The broader implication is, how can we help if uh, even the Ukraine sometimes doesn't help us to help them and creates a situation which is a tense relationship bilaterally. Uh, this is, I believe, a theoretical question also in front of us we have to confront. Uh, but, you know, bilaterally we are there. And I'm asking, uh, do you have any idea how Thank to you, approach Zoltz. this issue? Thank you very much. And now to Lithuania, Mr. Vitautas Parkas, please. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mogherini, my colleagues, Lithuania remains of the position that certain statements of Rome declaration should apply not only to Western Balkans, but, but to Eastern European states as well. We understand very well that the association agreement is not the ultimate goal in their relations with the EU. We must rely on the notion that acknowledging the European aspiration of our partners entails the long, complex, costly work they should do in order to move forward. And it is upon us, the EU, to super them be keeping the door open for those partners who are delivering. Madame Mogherini, what kind of message we send today to Eastern Partnership countries? Thank you, Vitautas. And uh, last but not least in this group, uh, I'm very glad to in introduce the uh, President of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Mr. Paolo Aile from Italy. Paolo, please. Thank you, Marco. Uh, two points which go far from uh, Europe. Uh, the first one is China. Uh, we have seen the new type of colonialism of China in, in Africa, and uh, now the Belt and Road project uh, seems to be not much different, in my opinion, because this is um, considered by the Chinese um, economical project, but in my opinion is uh, the largest geopolitical project ever done in, in the history of mankind. What do you think, uh, Federica, about this project? Could it be the problem for Europe in the long term, also considering that 16 countries from European countries will be touched by this project. Second point, you paid a very important visit to India. Uh, could you update us on, on the relationship you are building uh, with India? Because I think in also this one in the, in the long term could be a balance to the superpower of China and Russia. Uh, an alliance between Europe and uh, India could be very interesting. Also, considering Brexit. Thank you, Paola. Federica, the floor is yours. I start from that. Uh, first of all, to honor my uh, former colleague, uh, but also because uh, it's indeed two important questions, uh, also the others, but uh, it's also good to look a bit uh, away from our uh, borders. India. Um, I think the Indians, I, I don't only think I know, uh, having heard that directly from the Indian Prime Minister uh, during my visit, the Indians understand very well that no matter how big one is, 27 is always more. 
uh, and I think this is deep in their understanding. When it comes to politics, when it comes to global power, when it comes to security, when it comes to trade, when it comes to culture, when it comes to everything. Uh, we are going to have the first uh, uh, EU-India summit in a while now, um, in uh, a month from now, in Delhi, uh, that we have uh, prepared uh, carefully in this last couple of months. I met the Indian uh, minister just uh, in, uh, in Bled, in Slovenia, a few days ago, uh, to finalize preparations. Uh, I can say that with India we have uh, uh, a lot we share when it comes to our global agenda. Think of climate change, think of the work on uh, uh, urbanization, if you think of the work on cultural diplomacy, if you think on, uh, of the um, free trade agreement negotiations we could relaunch or the economic uh, uh, and investment uh, uh, chapter, uh, we definitely have uh, an interest as well as we share an interest in trying to bring security and stability in their region. Think of Afghanistan or think of Central Asia, definitely we do share also a security agenda there. Um, so I think that relations will uh, will increase. Uh, obviously, we might continue to have some difficulties, but uh, I see a positive agenda in front of us with India. Uh, with China in Africa, um, I know the narrative is uh, is this uh, sort of uh, r rush uh, of China in, into Africa with investments and uh, um, and a competition on the African territory from our side. I have to tell you that uh, um, during all the most recent visits we had and we, we, we exchanged uh, and we meet very regularly with the Chinese leadership, uh, both in China and in, in the European Union, um, we decided actually to cooperate, European Union and China, in Africa. When it comes in particular to the security conditions in some African areas, I was mentioning before the Horn of Africa uh, or the Sahel, uh, there is uh, a lot that we can uh, uh, do together in that respect, and uh, uh, I believe this is a sector of uh, further cooperation. On the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative, um, the European Union was present uh, at uh, its launch uh, uh, in, in Beijing with Vice President Katainen. Um, there is a, a common understanding between us that uh, uh, we would see an interest as European Union in this initiative, provided that first um, represents, uh, I would say, an opportunity for all, according to transparent and uh, uh, acceptable standards. Uh, as you know, uh, we have an issue when it comes to uh, standards <laughs> um, in terms of investments and trade uh, when we discuss with China. Um, that this is uh, an initiative that is open for opportunities to all Europeans and not only to some, uh, and uh, also that this is done in terms of full respect of the European standards and procedures when it happens on the European territory. And we know very well that this means certain uh, implications when it comes to uh, standards for investments, labor and environment and so on, so on and so forth. Um, but for sure, the idea of connecting Asia and Europe with all that implies in the in-between territories is a very interesting, strategically important perspective also for Europeans. The question mark is not if it's good or not in itself, it's how it's going to be implemented. Uh, that is the, the approach we're taking. Um, Eastern partnership, I tried to, well, uh, on the, um, we have an important um, event during the Estonian presidency when it comes to the Eastern Partnership. We have the summit uh, coming up. It's going to be in Brussels, but it's going to be under Estonian mm -hmm. presidency. Uh, and uh, um, I uh, do believe that this can be the summit with our Eastern partners that focuses on uh, the positive agenda and on the delivery of the, for the people. We have delivered on visa liberalization. We've delivered in, on the ratification and the entry into force of the association agreement and the DSFTA. Uh, we have delivered uh, on uh, um, also looking beyond Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. Uh, we finalized the agreement with Armenia. We're negotiating uh, the agreement with Azerbaijan. We are in a much better place today than it was the case a couple of years ago when it comes to concrete results for the citizens of our partners. Also in terms of economic and trade uh, results uh, coming out of our agreements, there is a lot that ne still needs to be done, I think in particular to some of them, then I don't want to 
point out to one or the other. Uh, when it comes to the work on the reform of judiciary, uh, anti-corruption, rule of law, uh, a lot of reforms that still are um, to be um, carefully implemented and put in place. Um, when it comes, so the message to the Eastern Partnership uh, countries uh, from the European Union is this. It's a partnership that from our side, it's a matter of commitment and unity of all of us. It's a positive agenda that unites us and it delivers for the citizens. On the European aspiration of the Eastern Partnership, you know that this is a divisive argument, sometimes bef between them as well, uh, also between among us, but also among them. I have also to tell you one thing that is basically linguistic, but also conceptual. I have a problem, as I have a problem of talking about the enlargement for the Western Balkans, I have a problem in defining European aspirations, the aspirations of the Eastern Partners, because they are European already. Uh, they might have European Union aspirations, but it's Europe. <laughs> I think we have to be careful on how we use the word. I know that in, to, for ease of reference, we say European aspirations, um, but I think we have to recognize we're talking about Europeans. Um, and um, I also think uh, that, uh, I hope, and I think that this Easter Partnership Summit will be the one where we will manage to make absolutely clear and the message will manage to be heard and uh, decrypted um, where it has to be heard and decrypted, that um, Eastern Partnership is not a policy against anyone, is a, is a positive agenda, is a policy for uh, our friends uh, in these countries, and it's not a policy directed against any of our other neighbors. Uh, on the Ukrainian law adopted uh, uh, last week, uh, we discussed this point just uh, one hour ago because uh, the Estonian presidency at the end of the Gimnik uh, uh, took the initiative to invite the foreign ministers of the Eastern Partners, which was uh, a very welcomed um, initiative. Uh, I took part to that meeting as well, um, also to prepare the, the, the summit and to see where we are on bilateral relations. The issue was indeed raised uh, and discussed, uh, so I'm not only fully aware of that, but also um, trying to accompany all possible solutions that can be put in place. Um, terrorism is fast, Europe is low. Well, we are all Europeans in this room, so we have a collective responsibility, I guess. Uh, but apart from that, which is not a joke, because sometimes I feel we have um, a sort of shortcut in front of us whenever we see uh, something going wrong or not going well as it should be or going too slow or going too fast. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes I face uh, some ministers or some prime ministers telling me, you know, this decision is going too fast on defense, for instance. Some are telling me, you know, we need more time. One year to do the European defense is, is, is too short. We need to be more reflective. We need to uh, have a sediment of our decisions uh, because uh, decision-making is going too fast. I'm always happy to have fast decisions because I think we need to be um, quickly acting and reacting in this, in this world. Uh, but Europe is not always slow. Uh, we put in place Operation Sophia in one month. Um, we established uh, the Joint uh, Military Command uh, in Brussels uh, in a couple of months, something that for 40, 50 years was simply not even possible to put on the table, and that was done in a couple of months. Sometimes decisions we take are fast, some other times as a law. Uh, sometimes democracy is law. Uh, if you are one and you decide in the single um, room of your office or your bedroom, a decision might be very fast, but might be wrong. <laughs> uh, and you might face quite some difficulties in turning Actually, them into a reality. Time, huh? Yes, we have a complicated decision-making process. We have unanimity in some decisions at 28. Oh. We have a European Parliament that has a say. Uh, on uh, most of the issues we decide upon, including the budget, which is not an irrelevant issue for turning our decisions into a reality. Uh, and you know that very well. In national parliaments, uh, national politics also takes time. Uh, from a parliamentary uh, proposal to be turned into uh, a law of a country, um, I don't want to use the example of the country I know best for obvious political <laughs> reasons, but I'm sure that in all countries it takes time to take a decision and to turn it into a reality. Sometimes this is a guarantee that uh, uh, you have a certain quality and you have a certain number of checks and balances. 
there is a number of people that can warn if there is a big mistake coming up. Uh, and you can listen. But apart from that, we can be fast and we should be fast on certain issues. On counterterrorism, that again is only partially my job, because as you know very well, internal security is the national competence of interior ministers. Um, so it's double not my job, <laughs> uh, because it's national competence and it's a competence of interior. Uh, but there are some things on counterterrorism that we have put in place in this last year that were not there before, and we've done it quite fast. We have deployed a number of counterterrorist experts in our embassies, EU embassies, in key places. Middle East, Balkans, North Africa, some other areas where uh, we need to exchange information. We've started a series of counterterrorism expert dialogue, exchange of information, exchange of back practices. We are working on some uh, aviation security um, talks uh, with key countries. Uh, so there are some external legs of the internal work on counterterrorism that we have put in place. Some of them go a bit beneath the radar because they are less sexy for the overall community uh, or because they might need a bit more of confidentiality without being necessarily secret. Uh, but again, I hope, uh, and I close on this point, but then I go also on the EU-Africa coordination, I hope that the lesson is learned inside Europe. And here national parliaments have a say in terms of exchanging information among member states. I think that is the real point. We can liaise more and work more with our partners around the world, and we are doing that, and we need to do that more, including learning lessons on how to prevent, how to detect, radicalization, other things. But member states have to trust each other because people move. Even when they don't move, they're connected inside the European Union much more than anywhere else. And we're not living anymore in the time of national security. We live in the time at least of European security. So this needs to be overcome. And I think a lot has been done in this respect. On EU-Africa coordination, I'm perfectly happy with the way in which it's working, uh, you were asking. Um, a couple of years ago, Africa was not necessarily a priority for all EU member states. There was a certain geographical division of uh, tasks or um, a natural, historic or geographical inclination. Today, I think all member states, all countries recognize that Africa is our closest neighbor, our uh, strategic investment, I would say, in terms of uh, demography, in terms of energy, in terms of economy, in terms of security, uh, in terms of climate, no matter what field, Africa is there, very close, and potentially a big opportunity or potentially a big risk. And I'm happy because we've developed a high uh, level of European investment on Africa, uh, economic, uh, cultural, political, security, diplomatic, whatever. Um, we have made it visible. Uh, I was proud. I was the first one visiting the new African Union Commission leadership the day after they started to symbolize the friendship, the, the, the sisterly, brotherly relations we have as two unions. And I'm happy because we have witnessed a unique uh, experience in Africa which is that of heads of state and government of ministers of member states visiting African countries, in some cases on my behalf, bringing the European Union agenda. Yep. This is really, it happens uh, with many uh, leaders or ministers of member states, this is really the European Union at its best. Because we don't have to be obsessed with the fact that we only one has to speak, and that's me. It's great, but I'm one. Uh, we are hundreds of millions, <laughs> and the real purpose is to have all our prime ministers, chancellors, presidents, ministers, to have the full ownership of the work we're doing with Africa, and whenever they visit bilaterally, for sure they will have a bilateral agenda, but then to put forward, first and foremost, the European agenda, and become in this way the European Union ambassadors, as it should be, because at the end of the day, the European Union is all of us. 
So I'm, I'm very happy with the way in which we have uh, um, shaped it. And uh, I believe this will be uh, very much evident when we will have the EU-African Union Summit in Abidjan in November. This is going to be extremely uh, important. Let me say one Estonian thing, not in Estonian because I'm, 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 I would not be able, <laughs> uh, but I appreciate it enormously. Uh, and the Africans appreciate it also enormously. The decision that the Estonian government took uh, just after taking over the presidency, I think it was just July, of uh, doubling uh, their contribution to the Africa Trust Fund. Uh, being Estonia, a country in the north with no specific or particular relation with any African country, that was perceived as a truly European move of political investment. This, is, this was really an excellent move, very much appreciated, and for which I congratulated the government already. Uh, I don't know if I have to congratulate the, um, the, the parliament as well, because I guess the money comes from the decision of the parliament, so sure. it, will, uh, it also involves you. But congratulations, that was the right choice. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Federica. Uh, now, one of the questions was also addressed to David. Uh, please, very briefly. Yes. Uh, we have 14 minutes uh, left. There are 14 uh, uh, okay, people look. going to ask a question, so yeah. we need to be very brief now. Yes. Mr. Fanan and I would suggest that we discuss this later because there are still 14 speakers left. We have many, a few minutes left. But from my point of view, very briefly, I can just say I couldn't agree more with the High Representative. Um, I think that the EU policy on Africa is more coordinated than it used to be. I know that there are many of you in national parliaments and the European Parliament who are always calling for us to pay more attention to Africa, to do more and do better. I think this is finally happening. Uh, the European Parliament, for instance, will be very active in the run-up of the EU Africa Summit end of November in Abidjan, and we will probably also present uh, our point of views, what has to be done better in our EU Africa policy. I think you all agree here that we have to do more for sustainable growth, creating jobs for the people, and we have to do much more for the education and training of the younger people. And of course, we have to fight, help the Africans fight corruption. We all know the future of our continent is very closely linked to the future of our southern neighbor. Okay, Marco and I will uh, pull now seven questions each. And please be very brief, and uh, Federica, may I say also, be very brief. We will go, I, th I guess, around 10 minutes into our coffee break, which will leave us 20 minutes for the uh, rest and coffee. So please, now, um, Zeliana Zovko from the European <coughs> Parliament. Right, uh, my question is for Madame Mogherini. Um, right, um, I commend you for your nice words about Western Balkan and for all the actions that you are undertaking to um, improve uh, the position of the candidate and um, um, countries and um, uh, potential candidates. But I would like to express my concern, uh, not only mine, but the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, on the last vo um, on the budget uh, and the Commission's proposal to decrease allocation of 90 million for IPA instrument for the year 2018 especially taking into consideration that IPA is one of the most important instruments for the implementation for socio-economic reforms and uh, political and institutional reforms for candidate and potential candidate countries. And considering the, that keeping the pace for reform implementation is directly affected by our support, I would like you to reconsider, I mean, to, for the Commission to reconsider position to decrease those resources. Slowing down with reform implementation could affect the stability and security, and in the end, affect our own safety at the borders. Miracle Mando, Signora Mogherini. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Michael Galler, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm here uh, for information. First, as was just said on Africa, as chairman of the delegation for relations with the Pan-African Parliament and the EP, we'll meet just ahead of the summit in 20 MEPs, 20 members of the Pan-African Parliament, and present our uh, points of view how to proceed. That is one information. Second, just uh, five minutes walk from here, some hours ago, the EPP group decided on a very ambitious paper on security and defense. I may inform you we support all the efforts and what you are um, what you are going to implement now it has been long our uh, plea also to get there we are now finally there congratulations to activate pesco in this equation between high level of ambition on pesco and inclusiveness where do we stand that's one question S second question you named there are already 30 projects 
I'm in the favor of having projects, but it should not be PEPCO, Permanent Project Coordination. It should be PESCO, a permanent structured cooperation. So a question. We have suggested, why don't you set up in the Commission uh, a DG on defense to support you as Vice President of the Commission in this regard and also have far more competence for project and capability development in the framework of EDA. You're the head of EDA. You should uh, be ambitious in this regard as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and let's fire away immediately. Uh, Pierre-Alexander Angla, please. Yes, thank you, Mrs. High Representative. You already uh, spoke about uh, the situation in Venezuela, but uh, a few days ago, the, the Spanish government and the French authorities opened the way uh, to possible targeting, targeting sanctions against the, those responsible for the situation. So I'd like to know your, your views on that. And the second point that we didn't touch upon until now is the situation in Myanmar and the Rohingyas. Uh, I'd like to have your views on that. I'd like to know what is the dialogue with the uh, authorities in the country, and if you could uh, brief us uh, on that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And um, Ioannis Kefalayani, please, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since we'll all agree that we cannot afford uh, to rest idle in the foreign uh, policy domain, we welcome today's discussion on our priorities in the field of uh, common foreign and uh, security policy, including common security and uh, defense policy. And uh, Greece attaches importance to the implementation of the global strategy, both as regards security and defense, as well as to other aspects such as resilience and implementing and updating uh, existing strategies. So my question is, uh, how can we promote <coughs> a rules-based global order, which is among EU global strategy scopes, when at the same time many of our member states do not feel safe or face violations of their sovereignty by third states, and how can be convincing and be perceived as a global superpower when at the same time we are unable to safeguard Baltic states, for example, against Russian aggressiveness, or Greece against the Turkey's daily violations of its airspace and sea borders, or Turkey's illegal occupation of Cyprus half soil. If we cannot protect our home, how can we have leverage on other areas of the world? Thank you. Uh, thank you. And another speaker from Greece, Konstantinos Tosinas, please. Yeah, like uh, London buses, the Greeks are late, but they come in twos, you know. So uh, let me make a wider comment about the format of this uh, conference and link it with some of the comments we heard this morning from our learned speakers. It seems to me that we are politicians. I'm an academic, but I'm here as a politician. And when we are here as politicians, we need to have proper political debate, not to have sophisticated press conferences in which we ask questions for 30 seconds and are given answers, not by Ms. Mongherini, because she is a politician and therefore she has an element of accountability, both to European and our own parliaments. We heard this morning that because the European Union is terribly complex and it is very complicated to run it, we should be telling our citizens that they should not care about what is happening to the European Union, that somehow these are, this is business to be dealt with by the experts, the technocrats, and so on. In political philosophy, we call this the post-political or the post-democratic condition. And at the point at which we have this complex series of crises, it seems to me that this kind of complacency should not exist. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And now the speaker from Czech Republic, Karel Schwarzenberg. Uh, in your initial speech, it was interesting for me that you never spread the word of Ukraine and, and of Turkey you just mentioned in a side way. Uh, these, are, but these are the two most burning questions we have in Europe and in our neighborship directly. Uh, I would like to hear more about uh, the prospect of policy. Ukraine makes incredible progress. They make nonsense. There's still a grave problem of corruption and this law, language laws was a nonsense. Still, they are making great progress. <laughs> but uh, the war is going on there, and we have uh, what's happening in Turkey, we can daily re read in the newspaper. I would ha have loved to her, uh, hear from you what is EU policy in the future towards these two countries. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And the last speaker for this slot, Massimo Artini, please. Buongiorno Federica. Grazie di fare l'intervento in italiano, quindi se possibile... Okay. Con te è sicuramente... <laughs> 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 
Bene. Bene. Eh, relativamente all'ultima parte del tuo intervento eh, riguardo la cyber, ehm, volevo sapere da parte della, della Commissione qual è il punto rispetto all'implementazione da parte dei paesi nazionali, se c'è un monitoraggio rispetto all'implementazione della direttiva NIS e quindi se oltre a averla definita c'è anche rispetto alla scadenza che ormai è maggio 2018 e quindi è relativamente vicina, se c'è una valutazione rispetto a quella che è l'armonizzazione da parte di tutti i paesi di quelle norme che sono un minimo comune denominatore rispetto a quella che è una materia che nel dire potrebbe essere effettivamente molto sensibile per tutti i paesi. Massimo, grazie per la domanda anche se devo ammettere che non so Massimo, grazie per la domanda anche se devo ammettere che non so Massimo, grazie per la domanda anche se devo ammettere che non so Massimo, grazie per la domanda anche se devo The, uh, the, the, the an implementation, an implementation mechanism has been uh, developed and there is a, an implementation mechanism is going on. I don't have the state of the art of the implementation state of the directive, but I'll surely let you have that information and also pass on this information to the colleagues who are interested in this. Some of the interventions were actually observations, so no need for me to answer. Uh, one point on uh, uh, the budget for uh, the Western Balkans. The Parliament has instruments to work together with us, and we can work together in that respect, uh, also with Commissioner Han. Uh, glad that there is wide support uh, on uh, uh, PESCO. Ambition and inclusiveness at the moment are the two elements that are kept together. Um, I believe it's important that we go on uh, on the basis of uh, all member states uh, being, uh, being possibly interested in joining, uh, but reminding ourselves it's not compulsory and uh, it doesn't require unanimity. On the contrary, it's an instrument provided by the treaties exactly to go forward um, in, a, uh, in a non uh, um, consensual manner. Uh, But it's very important for me to make clear, or at least to encourage, because as you know, PESCO is an instrument in the hands of the member state. I can accompany, support the process. It's not an initiative I put on the table. It's member states driven. Uh, but for me, it's essential politically, especially in this moment of the European Union, that it is clear that it is not a project or a process for the big member states to run faster than the others. I think it's a process that has a lot to offer and from which many can take advantage, regardless of the size of the countries, of the budget of the countries, and of the size of the industries, uh, of the defense industries of the countries. Um, and I'm confident that this will be the case. For the moment, I see a basically unanimous interest uh, in joining PESCO. Uh, which is fine. Then we can have some modularity in what is done by some and what is done by others. Uh, projects, I agree, it shouldn't become what in Italian we would call a progettificio, uh, a project machine. Uh, but on the other side, it has to be concrete, output-oriented. So I think we will find uh, the right balance, member states will find the right balance, yeah. we will assist uh, in having the right level of operationality and without dispersing energies, including economic resources, in a myriad of uh, different small projects. Uh, on uh, the level of institutional ambition for the future, personally, I would tend to be a bit uh, cautious. You know I'm normally not particularly cautious. <laughs> uh, the treaties are very clear where the responsibility stands when it comes to defense and security and that is the Council of Member States. The Commission has a clear responsibility when it comes to the industrial aspects of defense, and we have DGs in the Commission that have the instruments, the competence, and are doing the work when it comes to the industrial policies, including in the field of defense. I think we have to handle this with care. On top of that, the ES has some competencies, also quite clearly defined by its defining starting act, and as you mentioned, the European Defense Agency has uh, its clear competence, expertise, and it's proving to be, exactly now, the, um, the instrument that is uh, uh, proving its, its value to put in place these policies. Because member states, through the ADA, are actually, for instance, now 
um, in October, starting uh, the uh, coordinated annual review um, on defense, which is done with the instruments we have. So I would tend in this phase to focus our work on the content and on the way in which put in place the policies, rather than starting to reflect on institutional innovations or structures. Because what I see is that if the political will is there and is there, we manage perfectly well with the instruments we have. I would, um, avoid, I would tend to avoid to create either overlappings or duplications that could confuse a bit uh, things. But again, it's a discussion we can have in the future. Venezuela sanctions, um, I lost you, but uh, there was a question uh, from a French colleague. Um, we started, yes, you're there. Um, we have um, put on the table some options, including some options for consideration of individual restricted measures. Um, the debate among member states could start in the coming days. Again, it's not the main headline uh, for the moment because the focus on Venezuela is still I would say on the diplomatic and political work we can do, but uh, I've offered some uh, some options that would, could be considered by member states, uh, always on the basis of unanimity. On Myanmar and the situation of the Rohingya, um, I uh, was in contact just a few days ago with the foreign minister of Indonesia that visited um, both Myanmar and, uh, and Bangladesh and is uh, following the issue very closely. Um, it is an, an issue that indeed is, uh, is quite a priority for us, even if it's far away, first of all, because the European Union has played an important role in Myanmar uh, in the uh, changes that have taken place and also in the uh, agreements. Um, we have also a formal role there. Uh, I have met Aung San Suu Kyi uh, when she came to visit uh, us in Brussels a few months ago. We've tackled all the all the easy and all the difficult issues, uh, very openly and very frankly. Um, we will have uh, the foreign ministers meeting European Union ASEAN uh, in Myanmar later this autumn, and that would for sure be one of the opportunities we will have to discuss also about this. Um, um, other interventions were uh, more observations, uh, some of them, by the way, I, uh, I share. Um, uh, coming late, it's not so important if you come to the right place. <laughs> At the end of the day, you can be on time in the wrong place, and that's no use in that. Uh, but uh, apart from the joke, uh, um, I, I think we should never, never, never refer to the European Union as something technical or bureaucratic. I think it's our house, it's our common house, and there is nothing uh, too difficult about that. Complicated, yes, but life is complicated. Democracy is complicated. National mm, politics is complicated. Whatever is com mathematics is complicated. I I, uh, <coughs> I I don't know who referred to that, but I I invite you all as politicians, as member of parliament, to uh, to consider the European Union just another level of identity. Uh, none of you would find it contradictory to be from uh, Berlin and Germany. Uh, I'm from Rome and Italian and European. It's different levels of identity and it's different levels of decision making. You have a national parliament, you have a national government, you have a European parliament and you have a European Commission and the European Council. It's a different layer of, of decision making. It's our house and it's our common responsibility how it works. It works, it's also thanks of all of us. It doesn't work, it's also responsibility of all of us. It's what we make out of it. Uh, that's, my, that's my take. And on Ukraine and on Turkey, uh, I would be very pleased uh, to talk uh, more about that. I'm sorry I didn't uh, mention them more at length. That was the case in previous exchanges we've had in the previous uh, um, yeah. um, meetings. I tend to give you an overview of what the ministers mainly discussed or decided, because I think this is also uh, interesting for you, but I, I'm happy we had the opportunity to come back more, especially on Ukraine, on the Eastern Partnership during the Q&A, and I'm more than happy to exchange more on Turkey. Uh, I know that we will have the opportunity to do that in Strasbourg next week, uh, but also with national parliaments, uh, always happy to do that. But with the clear um, elements that uh, uh, David witnessed uh, this morning, uh, that uh, when it comes to the uh, accession negotiations when it comes to being a candidate country or not, 
uh, the level of uh, uh, engagement, the future perspectives of, uh, uh, of enlargement, uh, this is uh, um, not an issue for foreign ministers. This is not an issue for the Foreign Affairs Council. This is dealt with in a different uh, formation of the Council. This is not just a formality. Uh, this is also a matter of institutional respect. Yes. Uh, thank you, Federica. We are now uh, very much challenged with uh, time, actually. We, I, I told you that doing, uh, doing <laughs> this in groups of five would have... You do your, your job challenge. so well, so it's, uh, but we see the seven colleagues are still in the dating list. I'm, I'm just asking because we're really already uh, five minutes over. Could, could we agree that uh, three of you uh, get uh, the opportunity to, to get... Uh, oh, but... And how do you choose them? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the next one is, uh, I know we have a few minutes left, but uh, Ashta Gudrun, Helga Dottir from Iceland, please. Thank you very much. Um, I must say that I agree with Ms. Mogherini on the importance of cybersecurity and that we need to take it more seriously. However, we are, we are constantly seeing both nation states and the EU compromising proper cybersecurity in the name of various commercial or security interests. Right now, I can mention that the Estonian Council Presidency is a compromising proposal on the uh, copyright reform, which supports filtering of all internet uploads. This simply means privatized mass surveillance or generalized monitoring and censorship by private multinational companies online, which uh, leads me to my question. Isn't privatized mass surveillance incompatible with the notion of cybersecurity? Don't we need to work on cybersecurity more horizontally? Or is it really the intention to compromise cybersecurity in the name of commercial interest? Because that is what we're doing right now. Thank you. Next one, Mrs. Lolita Chigana. Uh, that's it. Almost like it. Thank you so much, Chairman. I have to say this is excellently organized debate because I have had most of my questions answered. And this is a large thanks to Frederica, to your very factual and concrete answers. But I have one more remaining question, and this is about uh, Middle Eastern peace process that you mentioned. And you said that there is a determination to push for a two-state solution. I think it's very important, and I really believe that it's very important that we keep that principle. Uh, but uh, how do you see, how do you do, uh, how do we engage with Israel? Uh, we know that there are excellent working level of relations, but when it comes to the top uh, political level, it's sometimes very difficult to talk to Israel. Um, what measures are you going to take to really make this uh, hopefully final push uh, come to the completion and to the concrete result? Thank you. Thank you. The next one, uh, uh, Mrs. Sabine Lösing from European Parliament. Uh, yes, thank you. It is one of the most important objectives of the global strategy to improve military capacities. And we all know the EU is far from having top military capacities. You said it is not an European issue how much European uh, member states should pay, but you are working on implementing the uh, strategy. The uh, 38.5 billion from the EU defense fund surely will not be enough. So where should the money come from and how much in addition sh should the citizens pay? And are you working on uh, new budget lines of the general EU budget for military spending? Thank you. The next one from Croatia, Miro Kovac, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to ask our friend David McAllister to say something about Russian influence and Turkish influence in, in the Balkans, quickly, a few words perhaps. And secondly, concerning uh, Federica Mogherini, uh, the principle of, of subsidiarity is one of the leading principles in the European Union. So border issues are not something the European Union is dealing with, nor the European Commission. It's they are dealt with by, 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 by states. Right now, we have approximately 10 or 11 border issues between EU member Puerto states, Rica. and they should, be, they should be solved by member yeah. states. Uh, we are members of parliament. The Croatian parliament obliged the government from Cro of Croatia to terminate the arbitration agreement because of a material breach. So the government is not in charge. It's our fault, the, the parliament's fault, and the government has to, has to respect uh, the decision of the Croatian parliament. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Kovac. The next one from European parliament, Mr. Tonino Piccolo, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Madam High Commissioner, we are a year away from the Brexit and uh, almost a year after presidential election in the USA. 
It goes without saying that both major events have impact on international relations. Do you see or do you feel in performing your duty as a high representative some changes in relation towards European Union or do you expect them? Mr. Alexander Stubb said this morning that both events can even affect positively European Union coherence and even speed up seeking for the solution. Do you agree? Thank you. The next one from Spain. Mr. Carlos Rons, please. Thank you. Terrorism is uh, uh, one of the biggest problems in the European Union and in the entire world. Uh, what is your position on the field that we need to keep working in police cooperation between the countries, uh, common intelligence forces, international cooperation, the cooperation with countries, for example, like Morocco is helping a lot. Also, the European action in the Sahel, as you have said, European Union in uh, an Africa summit, and the cooperation in the fight against radicalization, as uh, you have said, inside our cities in Europe also, the radicalization and the criminal doctrine travels around the world, including European Union, and we have to fight against it in internet and outside the internet. In the field that we have to fight against financing terrorists, how fast we are moving ahead in an European prosecutor office and in the recognition of the fundamental role of the victims of terrorism with a special status in the European Union based in the principle of memory, dignity and justice. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least, from Croatia, Mr. Joško Klišević. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, going back to the question of rule of law raised by a Slovenian uh, colleague, uh, rule of law means that parties to the legal proceedings, which should result in, in uh, settlement of border issues, behave legally and that they do not cheat each other. If one of them behaves illegally, the other has a right to withdraw from these, from these proceedings before the uh, uh, arbitration award is rendered. My question to you, Madam Mogherini, does the EU want to send a message that illegal behavior in legal proceedings leading to uh, uh, settlement of territorial disputes is acceptable for the EU? I hope not. I hope not. Slovenia and Croatia should sit together. They already have at the level of prime ministers. Uh, Slovenia can bring uh, a content of arbitration award as a starting point to discussion. And maybe the final agreement will not be far away from that. But as a matter of principle of international law, this award cannot be accepted. Thank you very much, Federica. Uh, I will follow the suggestion of our Croats friends and not enter into the content of this issue, so I will not reply to the questions. But I notice that the two prime ministers are meeting, the two presidents are meeting. Uh, I was in Dubrovnik the day when the arbitration was uh, coming out, and I saw the two presidents being there together, so I count on the wisdom, good neighborly relations of two member states of the European Union uh, to understand each other and find their way. Uh, respect of rule of law for the European Union also in terms of European Union credibility is fundamental. Then it's up to the member states to define how uh, to um, implement um, our principles on rule of law. Uh, but it is not irrelevant to the European Union credibility and also for their impact on the region. You know that very well. Um, on the Middle East peace process, um, the European Union engages with Israel at the highest possible level, um, the highest political level. I've had different and many meetings with the, the Prime Minister that is also the Foreign Minister. Uh, we know each other well. Uh, we have meetings at all um, different uh, uh, stages and levels. It's clear that at the moment uh, we are not close to uh, finding a solution on, on the Middle East peace process. Uh, I see that both in Israel and also in uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority, the attention is more on internal dynamics, um, internal politics, and also some security uh, issues that are understandable but are diverging from uh, the, um, the search for the two-state solution and, and peace uh, for different reasons. Um, this is not a reason for us to disengage. On the contrary, this is a reason for us to reaffirm our commitment, our support uh, and encouragement and willingness to accompany a process that we believe would be in the interest of the Palestinians, of the Israelis, for their security, for their um, future and their present, for the region and so also for the European Union. Uh, Sabina, no EU budget for uh, military uh, as such. Uh, 
but there is one point that I uh, have encouraged member states to look at uh, in a more regular and structured manner, which is not an EU budget issue, but could come in uh, reflection for the next MFF, uh, which is uh, the functioning of the Athena mechanism. Uh, we have discussed this issue that I understand is not so passionate <laughs> and not quite technical, but it is an issue because every time that we establish a mission or an operation, I have to go capital by capital and ask for force generation, money to run the operation. And this is the problem, part of the problem why the battle groups were never deployed, because we do not have the common funding uh, automatically. So to make uh, a long and complicated story short, uh, I think that, and it is not again an issue for now of putting EU budget money on, into military issues, but I believe that if we're serious about the European defense, including the operational instruments, that again, it's not about going and bombing anywhere, but it's about, for instance, doing training to security forces of our partners or uh, having um, operations or missions, uh, including in the Middle East, uh, um, to assist our friends, or in, in the east of Ukraine, uh, in the east of, of Europe, uh, we need a certain uh, predictability of resources. Uh, that would allow the European Union um, security and defense instruments to be uh, available and operational without uh, having to go through the entire painful um, uh, decision process, uh, capital by capital. We will. Uh, and we will seek, uh, and I know I can count on some European Parliament uh, uh, support uh, for the next MFF to find uh, a way to tackle this issue properly. But I hope that already now, because the Athena, the Athena review is currently ongoing, I hope that member states under the wise and active Estonian presidency will manage to find uh, a way to increase the level of ambition uh, of how we spend, we have common spending uh, on, uh, on this. Um, uh, on terrorism police cooperation, I already replied. Uh, on cybersecurity, I'm afraid I'm lacking the technical um, competence to answer properly to your question. Uh, I apologize for that. I'm sure that my Estonian friends would have much more uh, of that um, than myself. And last but not least, Tonino, I would like to close on this. Uh, yes, there are, you, you are here. Uh, yes, there are. There have been changes uh, towards the European Union in the world uh, after the last uh, year um, earthquakes, uh, the political ones, because unfortunately we also had physical ones. Um, I see uh, from, I was mentioning before about India, um, a renewed attention towards the European Union. I was mentioning China, uh, I don't think it's purely by chance, if in the last year or so, um, for maybe the first time ever, we had uh, twice uh, a long meeting with the Chinese defense minister. It's not naturally the case that a country like China recognizes in the European Union a security interlocutor. Normally it's a trade economic partner, but not necessarily going to the field of security and defense. Um, not to mention the atmosphere we find in Latin America uh, or in Canada uh, or in Mexico, which is also Latin America, and I could continue with the list uh, towards the European Union. Not to mention Africa that has always looked towards the European Union as the natural partner. This to say that, uh, yes, there is an opportunity for the European Union. Uh, it opened up um, last year. I have to tell you very frankly that uh, um, together with the opportunity, I think came also an internal shock that didn't put us immediately in the conditions to catch the opportunity and respond to it in terms of being an opportunity. I think that the turning point was the celebration, was evident at the celebrations of the 60th anniversary of the Rome Treaties, where the 27 reaffirmed with an energy that I have not seen before around the council table. Uh, their willingness to not only keep the union up and running, but even reinforce the level of European integration at 27. That moment of awareness, that political step, that relaunch of the European integration process, allowed us, and personally me, to go around the world, from Chile to Japan, 
from uh, Addis Abeba to Ottawa to say credibly, because I would have done it anyway, <laughs> but credibly and strongly, we are here. You know what you get when you talk to the European Union and when we work with the European Union. We are credible, we are reliable. We don't speak with different voices. You know that for us, human rights standards are important. And that is true and that will continue to be true. You have a problem with that, you live with that. But you also know that we are reliable when it comes to the sustainable development goals, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to the support to the UN system, when it comes to the support of a free and fair global trade system, when it comes to a certain approach to peace and security, and I could go on and on and on. So, Yes, this profile of the European Union as an indispensable, reliable partner in the world, bilaterally and in multilateral fora, has gone up in an immense way in the last uh, six, seven months. And um, I think we can build on that. Thanks. Thanks also for allowing me to close on a positive note. It doesn't happen often. Thanks. <laughs> OK, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, to conclude, let me first of all thank you for your past participation and your really good questions and interventions. But let me especially thank the High Representative. After three challenging days with the Defence Ministers and the Foreign Ministers, she came here to speak to us about her priorities on foreign policy, answering all these questions for more than two hours. And I would actually like to tell you, Federica, thank you so much for underlining the parliamentary dimension of EU's foreign policy. That's for one thing. <laughs> on Miro Kovac's question, we're discussing the Western Balkans tomorrow morning at 9, so where we can then also discuss a possible... Or 8.30. 8 I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not there. Can I, can I come back? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course you can. So we can then discuss possible Russian and Turkish influence in the Western Balkans. The next session will not start at 5, but I've been allowed to tell you it's going to be 5 past 5. So you have five minutes longer coffee break than now nine minutes with then the Estonian Foreign Minister Sven Mixer. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs>